to introduce Will McCollum. He's a PhD candidate at the University of Chicago. Um, I guess I met you in person just this past semester. Uh, he very kindly let our field school join him up in um, Redmond Park to um, do some excavations with him, which was a real treat. And so we're glad to have him here to share some of his own research. Yeah, thanks, thanks Will. Elliot. Yeah, it was really helpful having you guys come out. So really glad we made the connection. Thanks for the invitation, too. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be reading a rough draft of the paper. It's pretty, um, I would say speculative, and it's based on like my first interaction with a handful of artifacts, but it sort of draws on history, theory, and then archaeology. I wouldn't call it a traditional archaeology paper at all. I engage with kind of historical archaeologies of race, historical archaeologies of labor, uh, but this is a sort of different kind of piece of writing. So I'm mainly going to be reading um, Hopefully it's not the driest thing ever, but I'll be flipping through the slideshow too. Um, so yeah, I'll just get started. So the name of the paper is Anarchival Archaeology and Material Absence at a Black Mining Camp in Birmingham, Alabama. So for the past couple months, I've been undertaking my historical archaeology dissertation project at Smythe, a majority black turn of the 20th century iron mining camp at the foot of Red Mountain in Birmingham. Okay, so here is a basic, um, you know, Google is rendering map. Um, I didn't think I had to put on like a regional map for Birmingham. Um, since we're 50 miles down the road. Um, but the site Smythe is in Red Mountain Park. Um, and you've got Jones Valley uh, to the Northwest and then Chase Valley to the Southeast. And uh, Red Mountain sort of cuts through the Birmingham metro area, sort of landscape, kind of this dividing transect. You've got the city of Birmingham and Jones Valley. And then you have the sprawling kind of white flight uh, Southern sort of suburbs in Chase Valley. So Smythe is on the Shades Valley side of Red Mountain, and Red Mountain was home to a number of iron ore mines at the turn of the 20th century. So my site is um, I'm, I'm working at Smythe um, as one of those as one of those early mining camps. Uh, so yeah, um, the ruins of Smythe rest in what is now Red Mountain Park, a nature preserve that showcases Birmingham's industrial history. Exposed and abandoned iron ore mines and the ruins of other mining infrastructure are visible from the park's trails. And hikers are met by a series of historical packards relaying Birmingham boom at the end of the 19th century. While the park has done admirably well in its presentation of the city's industrial history to visitors, mining workers and their families who once called the park home are notably absent in Red Mountain Park's public history presentation. I found that this shortcoming is parallel to much of industrial archaeology, which largely confines its studies to the history of technological development, rather than to, than to the material practices of people engaged in industrial extraction and production. My project turns to the living quarters of Smythe to ask questions related to the material and spatial effects on workers and their families of what I frame as a racialized labor regime in Birmingham of the New South. Not exactly shockingly, the racial capitalist mode of extraction at Red Mountain evidences clear continuities with the antebellum chattel slavery structure. In my larger project, I wonder about the impingement of extraction, a kind of industrial production, into the domestic sphere. The houses at Smythe were owned by the company after all, and everything about the camp was oriented to the workplace, the mines. One material byproducts of the racialized extractive regime at Smythe is the production of absences in the historical and material record. Industrial archaeologist, um, Birmingham industrial archaeologist, Jack Bergstrasser, first worked at Smythe in 2011. He noted the scarcity of material culture and how this speaks to the poverty of workers and their families. I take the implications of this recognition uh, forward in my work at Smythe. The near total exploitation of workers at Smythe meant a clear constraint on their purchase of goods a constraint compounded by the requirement to buy with script at the company store. And Smythe workers were transient, moving often from job to job, from camp to camp. This posed a further constraint on their possession of portable objects. I meditate on these absences in this paper and propose a method for reading that avoids the archeological compulsion to overlay absences with empirical data. 
I draw on Black studies and anarchival methods of allowing archival gaps to redirect our investigative energy towards imagining, writing, and producing what could have been rather than what was, what could have been. And that's kind of the framing I carry forward. I return to these theoretical interventions below. This paper is still a draft and unfolds in fits and starts as I move between history theory and archaeology. I argue in the end that Smythe inhabitants, miners and their families could have created fugitive material life worlds in the gaps, even if those gaps were generated by relations of exploitative extraction and industrial production. This invites a kind of humility as I push back, as I push up against the limits of sayability and interpretability in the face of silences and invisibilities. Humility is further required by the fact of my still working at Smythe, uh, with most recovered material remaining unanalyzed. I finally get to the archaeology of all this in the second part of this paper, and I treat a small selection of artifacts that index possibilities of what could have been at Smythe at the turn of the 20th century. So here's just that's worker housing, that's um, an iron furnace, and stuff, a steel mill um, in Birmingham. Um, not actually related to my project, just a cool image. So Birmingham, upon its founding in 1873, was imagined to be the industrial capital of the New South, a position it held through the first half of the 20th century. Situated in the Jones Valley of North Central Alabama, Birmingham was in place in local proximity to the valley's rich mineral deposits. The city is the only place in the world with such immediate access to all three raw material inputs required for steel production, coal, iron ore, and limestone. Agricultural workers from around Alabama, especially black workers from the agrarian black belt, flocked to Birmingham at the end of the 19th century to try and make it in a new kind of Southern racial industrial capitalist regime. By 1910, as many as 90% of Birmingham's unskilled workers were black. At Smythe, miners were primarily indebted subcontract laborers working under foremen who were addressed as masters. The subcontract labor position was without exception reserved for Black unskilled workers in Birmingham. The resonances between the racialized labor structure at Smythe and its prefiguring child slavery structure become quickly evident. So this is a 1907 USGS map. Um, it's the Bessemer Quadrangle, and Smythe is actually between Birmingham in the Northeast and Bessemer in the Southwest. Um, and so this is just an inset. Um, and I'll return to this map, but it's what first led me to the site um, because it's, it very conveniently has actual buildings sort of labeled as these pinpoints. And I could actually input the building, the sort of, uh, the markers for buildings on this 1907 map, 1907 map into a basic GPS unit and just be taken sort of right to the site. Um, so that's how I first came upon Smythe is with this map. Uh, so Smythe is situated in Shades Valley at the base of Red Mountain the iron ore seam of which formed the extractive basis for Birmingham's growth in the late 19th century, with the district's earliest mining camps cropping up on and around its ridge. Let me grab water. Yeah, Maria, do you have your water bottle? Yes, it's in the new room. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we have the same water bottle too. So, yeah, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> so Smythe was one of the first mining camps to be established proximate to that scene, uh, the Red Mountain scene. Around 1888, the year the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company made Birmingham its headquarters. TCI owned and operated Smythe and the neighboring camps on Red Mountain before they were abandoned around 1920. Smythe represented the earlier rudimentary and improvisational form of industrial settlement in Birmingham. Once TCI was incorporated by U.S. Steel in 1907, the company began establishing planned company towns on the other side of Red Mountain from Smythe in Jones Valley. And these planned company towns are still Birmingham neighborhoods today that are kind of structurally abandoned. Um, and most of the neighborhoods in Birmingham were originally company towns, which is, if you get into it, a very interesting kind of patchwork in terms of kind of political geography. Um, so these settlements were more 
So the planned company towns um, were more closely overseen. So these are the ones that post-date the earlier rudimentary forms like SMITE. Um, so these company towns were more closely overseen by TCI as the company sought to standardize its labor policy according to emergent scientific management principles. Smythe marks the halting transition from an antebellum political economy to the instantiation of Birmingham in Birmingham of a fully nationalized industrial formation. If the later company towns were rigidly rationalized, Smythe remains flexibly improvisational and vernacular in its spatiality and the temporality of its casual transient occupation. The early camps at Red Mountain, including Smythe, were majority Black, with many of the residents having been formerly enslaved. These settlements off offer the possibility of a precise and localized examination of the old and new South materialities embedded in Birmingham as a racial capitalist configuration. We have little in terms of an archival record of Smythe, with the only direct historical references being the 1900 and 1910 census records as well as two maps, including this 1907 USGS quadrangle that I already said uh, first led me to the site um, in 2020. Uh, one deliberate archival erasure when it comes to Smythe is particularly glaring, uh, which is that the mining camps records were collected and retained by TCI, the company, uh, which then transferred them to US Steel in 1907 when TCI was incorporated by US Steel. And then now, um, uh, in whose in so the records are now housed um, under lock and key by U.S. Steel. Uh, so I've tried to um, I've tried to secure access, but I've been totally unsuccessful, which really isn't a surprise. Um, the SMI census data, so so the SMI census data is most of what I work what I can work with uh, historically, um, which is manuscript census data, which actually is very granular and includes. Um, place of birth, place of parents' birth, occupation, race, um, of course, age, uh, marriage status, uh, what else, uh, educational background. Um, so it's very detailed and very granular. And actually, despite only be being like pretty much the only written record I have access to, the 1900 and 1910 census uh, data sets, it's, it's been very helpful. Um, so the census data showed that in 1900, of SMI's 250 occupants, 76 were Black. And in 1910, of 209 occupants, 94% were people of color, 161 Black, and 35 residents listed as mulatto, which is a term that was used uh, in census forms until 1920. Um, yeah, so that's a racial category that remained until 1920. Uh, Smythe was constituted primarily by single family households alongside several boarding houses. Only four white workers lived at the site in 1910, and two of these were listed as salesmen, likely operating the company store. Of the 96 working people at Smythe, 67 were miners, uh, which were also called laborers in parentheses iron ore, uh, which is relevant below. Um, other, other documented occupations include day laborer, boarding housekeeper, washwoman, fireman, cook, driver, and section hand. Most notably for the present discussion, as I mentioned above, we know that the population was entirely transient. Not one inhabitant in 1900 remained in 1910. Smythe miners were subcontract laborers, a labor position that was reserved for unskilled black workers in Birmingham. As described above, the system had clear structural parallels with antebellum agrarian slavery and marks continuity rather than rupture across the anti to post vellum line. The subcontract labor system bears even bears similarity to the gang system operative on plantations with laborers in the mines working in teams that reported to foremen, who they called masters. Um, Smythe workers were part of the newly crystallizing black industrial working class, having had migrated to Birmingham from agricultural settings. It's perhaps, perhaps little surprise that they continued to labor under conditions of unfreedom and positions into which they were spotted by race. We have an indirect record of Smythe's participation in a Knights of Labor strike. Knights of Labor um, didn't have formal bargaining power with companies. It was more like a fraternal organization of workers, um, but they mounted a, an unorganized strike um, 
at, at the neighboring camp of Ishkuda in 1899. Uh, Smythe miners worked alongside Ishkuda workers in the same mines, and they certainly participated in the strike alongside Ishkuda workers. Uh, during which, during the strike, um, a thousand workers walked off the job at the Red Mountain Mines. To crush the strike, TCI, Tessie Pull and Iron Company, TCI, imported strike breakers from out of state, a commonly employed tactic. As reported in the census, many of Smythe's residents were from out of state, especially from Georgia, and were likely brought in as strike, as strike breakers. This maneuver by TCI had the consequence of driving a wedge to the base of workers at Smythe, with strike breakers being, of course, reviled by subcontract laborers who had struck. Um, so here's just an article sort of um, talking about how abysmal the sort of context, the labor conditions and living conditions were um, at Ishkuda, which was sort of Smythe's uh, neighboring camp that was very similar. Um, but it describes uh, the subcontract workforce in the Ishkuda mines, which are the mines that Smythe worked in um, as having been, being, ha having been totally exploited. And the reporter writes here um, that the worker at Ishkuda would better have been in the convict slopes at Pratt's. And the Pratt mines were the uh, coal mines operated um, by TCI that were um, worked in uh, by convict lessees. Um, the convict lease uh, structure in Alabama existed until uh, 1911, I believe. So I take the summary of the workforce and its situatedness at Smythe as presenting a particular archaeological problematic. First, Smythe workers labored under the most oppressive conditions in the Birmingham district. As a pretty obvious consequence, they had little access to pur purchasing power and the, for the most part, presumably lacked much in the way of portable possessions that might leave a dense material record amenable to archaeological examination. Further, workers' access to goods was limited to the availability of the company store, compelled as they were to buy with company scrip and often on debt before receiving their first monthly paycheck. What material might be taken as archaeologically diagnostic when Smythe residents likely had very few things at all to leave behind? This scarce materiality is overdetermined by its relation to another structuring factor at Smythe, which is that of the resident's temporality, their transiency. If Smythe's material record was already limited by the extreme poverty and indebtedness of the workers and their families, this limitation is further sedimented by the fact of the workers not sticking around the camp for very long, with not one occupant listed in the 1900 census also showing up in 1910. So there was sort of complete turnover between 1900 and 1910. So what would Smythe inhabitants carry on their person given their conditions of poverty and transiency? Historical archeology span takes this motivating principle to be uh, to fill the archival gap. Uh, that of repairing historical erasures concomitant to a community's broader marginalization. But what if the gap refuses its filling? How might an archeology span take the presence of a material absence as an epistemological condition and read around the absence rather than suffuse it with value and meaning. Historians of slavery, especially those working through a Black Studies lens, have produced counter histories around the edges of archival absences, pushing the limits of the sayable in light of historical violences and erasures of the lives of enslaved. Saidiya Hartman uh, defines her method as critical fabulation, um, which she says, by playing with and rearranging the basic elements of the story, by representing the sequence of events in divergent stories and from contested points of view, I have attempted to jeopardize the status of the event, to displace the received or authorized account, and to imagine what might have happened or what might have been said or might have been done. Um, and I sort of take that conditional framing of what might have been or you know what could have been as a kind of method here. Um, and then she says, quote, narrative restraint, the refusal to fill in the gaps and provide closure is a requirement of this method, end quote. I take this method of reading and writing as bearing immediate relevance for my aim to narrate material wor worlds as my given the historically contingent and the contingently necessary paucity of evidence. 
and in light of the material persistence of the Old South and the ostensibly New South in Smythe of Birmingham, with older residents having been born enslaved, Black Studies methods for reading around archival gaps in slavery's ledger seem well adapted to my work at Smythe. Another set of methods I draw in um, for my reading practices are those emergent in conversations surrounding um, the Ann Archive. These conversations have largely been staged in contemporary art and cultural theory contexts. The Ann Archive preserves traces of absences in the historical record, especially as pertained to material culture, and allows these dormant potentials to activate new lines of artistic production or historical production. And archival practices seek to decolonize historical memory by recognizing the ways that archives are shot through by power, the ways they dialectically make visible certain evidences as the upshot of suppressing others and vice versa. In thinking through the insufficiency of colonial archives, Corrine Zaman notes from an art quote from an archival standpoint, from an anarchival standpoint, archives are invaluable, not so much for preserving strands of the past, but rather for making visible the imprints of the absences of that which they fail to contain, end quote. So I'm working toward incorporating an anarchival perspective at Smythe in light of the true the two intractable absences related to the site. First, that of the, record, of the written record, an, absent, an absence immediately present on the outside of U.S. Steel's headquarters in Pittsburgh. And second, that of the relative absence of material culture as an effect of a particularly racialized mode of extraction. So I'll now turn directly to the evidence at Smythe to read what remains as traces of the outlines of absences of the gaps. As my fieldwork is ongoing, the notes here are perhaps premature and definitely provisional, much of the data remaining unanalyzed. But as I proceed, um, I explore modes of presentation and representation where empiricism fails and is sublated by the gaps. To stitch together a composite form, uh, a composite from scant traces requires certain other than empirical modes of representation. I focus here on just a few highly illuminative objects. The relative scarcity and volume of material calls for an attention paid to each thing, each made to bear a heavy narratological load. In the absence of a representative sample, especially since I'm in the middle of a field season, I pick up Hartman in imagining what could have been its mind. Um, and I, this is very sort of initial kinds of just reactions to material um, and reactions to individual artifacts. So I don't pretend it's otherwise. Um, first uh, to the site of Smythe. Uh, so this is a, another inset of this 1907 map. Um, I'll explain Smythe E and area A are sort of the areas I've been working in. Um, and this is where Jack Bergstrasser did his cultural resource assessment in 2011. Um, so Smythe was composed of uh, 52 structures upon its, its abandonment in 1920. Industrial archaeologist Jack Bergstrasser conducted limited excavations at Smythe in 2011 as a resource, a cultural resource assessment, preceding a proposed lake inundation project in Red Mountain Park, which didn't end up happening, but um, he was hired to sort of to do that assessment. Uh, in his project, Bergstrasser excavated around four structures representing four of five structure type, of five structure types present at Smythe. Bergstrasser's project came away with mostly unexceptional material, save a few highly diagnostic items, such as a glass perfume bottle stopper, a miner's check, and a medicine bottle for uh, Dr. King's new discovery for consumption, a fine indexing, the poor sanit sanitation, sanitation characteristic of mining camps um, in Birmingham at the turn of the 20th century. Most artifacts recovered were unidentified glass fragments, especially uh, window pane glass, um, and then also unidentified metal fragments. Bergstrasser concludes, quote, Smythe is important as an archeological site, not because of striking artifacts in high numbers, they don't exist. It is important because in its starkness, it reminds us of the really hard challenges those now silent ones 
who contributed so much to make Birmingham the magic city faced uh, each day. Bergstrasser limited his coverage to the area of Smythe, Southwest, uh, the Louisville and Nashville Railroad Spur. Uh, so this was the Louisville and Nashville Railroad, ran up here and down there, the Birmingham Mineral Railroad. Um, and so he did his work over here, sort of Southwest of where it turns that way. Um, and then I'm working on the other side of the railroad. Um, so critically, he included most fortified, so most structures, structure types in his excavation. But as a necessity of his coverage strategy, only one saddlebag house was sampled, despite 41 of the 51, 53 structures that Smythe having been in that form. So here's a picture of a, uh, so I'll explain what a, so a saddlebag um, is a duplex. It's the you know, most commonly found house type at this site and other sites of the time. Um, but it was a common plantation um, architectural form. Um, and it had two small rooms adjoined by a shared fireplace and fronted by a porch. As an antebellum architectural form, uh, these structures might offer the clearest evidence of continuity of antebellum spatiality in Birmingham of the New South. Um, so there, a couple of these houses still remain in Birmingham somehow. Um, so here's an example of one that is painted really like very cool color. So this, <laughs> this is a saddlebag shack. Um, there are only a couple or three that remain in Birmingham. Um, but those are the house the houses that were at Smythe and um, the houses I'm excavating in and around. So back to this map. Um, so in the 1900 census, each saddlebag duplex room was enumerated as a household. So um, households lived, uh, all, all the house, the whole household lived in one room of the duplex. Um, and then, but by 1910, after the population of Smythe had decreased from 250 to 209, uh, single households uh, lived in both rooms. So they had the whole house, each household did. Um, I decided to train my excavation's attention on the remains of these houses. Uh, the, 2011, uh, the 2011 project left the eastern portion of Smythe, what I call it Smythe, um, unexamined. The 1907 USGS map shows 15 structures as having been located to the east, uh, really the northeast of the railroad spur there. Um, and then another 1907 map that was available to Bergstrasser, which is an engineer's company map, uh, represents these structures as having been of the saddlebag type. Uh, so in 2020, I conducted pedestrian survey in Red Mountain Park and identified the structural foundations of several of these houses. Um, these structures are visible on the surface as piles of brick and large foundation stones. These piles index the collapsed chimneys of the duplexes. Uh, before excavations this season, I returned to an area surveyed in 2020, area A. So there it is, northeast of Smythe. Um, very, you know, it's it's about 200 meters. It's you know right next to Smythe, um, 200 meters east, uh, northeast, and uh, the area A was noteworthy in our survey for having been littered with early 20th century debris. In 2020, with the assistance of a UAB intern, I documented all surface material in Area A. I returned to Area A this uh, past November, um, and with two other, uh, with two UAB interns, we collected the artifacts first documented in 2020. The volume of material we collected in three days in November exceeds by far the volume we've recovered since then across six weeks of excavation. So uh, we got more just picking things up off the ground um, in area A, but there's very little on the surface as might be. Um, and I'm hoping to go back and excavate in area A, uh, you know, when I get funding. Uh, so initially I thought area A might've been Smythe's dump, but we also documented two structural foundations in the area that are distinct from Smythe's domestic forms. Based especially on a high number of mass-produced consumable objects, commodity objects, especially many early 20th century whiskey and so, uh, soft drink bottles, um, we found uh, a ton of like early, very strange local Birmingham soda bottlers that existed for two or three years and then disappeared. 
Um, so that was very, very weird and also cool. Um, so the highest volume of material uh, was surrounding one of the two uh, identified structures. And also you can see it's just, it's really wild how you can actually see where they place the dots. There are two dots up here in area A and you know, the structures, the two structures over there. Um, so it wasn't like we were surprised, um, but it was just like the faint sort of traces of foundations. Um, so uh, because there was all this material, a lot of it was uh, bottles for return to point of purchase. A lot of these um, bottles and other material were surrounding one of the structures in area A. So uh, we inferred that that's probably the company store. So all of that sort of trash and refuse uh, in area A was probably uh, thrown out um, maybe when the company store was abandoned. And uh, area A is set apart from the mining camp's living quarters where I'm currently excavating uh, and is situated at the base of the trail leading over Red Mountain to the mines. The other structure in area A might have served um, an administrative or managerial function. These two structures being set apart indicates their distinct function in contrast to Smythe's domestic spaces. The refuse in area A implies a proximity of a point of purchase, consumption, and disposal. Um, apparently, Smythe occupants were doing their socializing and their social consumption. We got a lot of whiskey bottles, um, but they were apparently socializing around the company store um, rather than around their living spaces, um, evidenced by the absence of these kinds of objects and goods in uh, Smythe in the living quarters. Area A's diverse assemblage still requires sustained analysis and contextualization, but as stands, the precise quality of the relationship between area A and Smythe E remains inexact. So I turn to Smythe E, um, not sure of the relation between Smythe E and this other area A. So I'm treating Smythe E kind of on its own. Um, and the limitations of the data I talk about uh, in this paper are related specifically to the very little that we found in Smythe E. So following our survey at area A, we turned our attention to the houses um, to the west of area A, but east of the railroad spur. So right there in Smythe E. Um, so small residential area and presently excavating. Uh, Smythe houses were oriented along the railroad in two rows and then heading east upon the southward redirection of the railroad, Smythe E rests on the dirt road running along the base of Red Mountain toward the trail to the mines. The mining camp's spatial structuring, planning, and settlement was likely initiated by the workers, not compelled by company oversight or protocol. The choice to live along the railroad line, uh, of, along the railroad, likely marks an organic functional settlement strategy related to the fact that residents were often on the move as transient workers and exhibited frequent mobility. Another, another settlement uh, pattern, uh, particular. Uh, particular to the mining camps at Red Mountain is that they're situated on the Shades Valley side of the ridge. Um, so that Shades Valley, um, uh, right down here, there's Red Mountain, uh, the iron seam being Red Mountain itself. Um, and so Smythe e is south of Red Mountain. Um, and then uh, the mines that were on the other side of Red Mountain, the Jones Valley side, which is also the seat of Birmingham. Um, so they lived across the ridge from the mines. Uh, uh, while the later company towns to which Smythe inhabitants relocated around 1920 were placed on the Jones Valley side within panoramic visibility of TCI management and the mines and their infrastructure. So Smythe inhabitants lived out of view of the workplace and uh, out of view of management um, and close company supervision. This fact is symptomatic of the earlier phase of industrial labor management in Birmingham, during which companies embrace a more laissez-faire approach to their workers living in their worker settlement. So this is a very, very basic map of the site I'm working at, which is it's just three of the houses. Um, so the structural foundations, uh, one, two, and three. I just set the grid over three of the houses. This is it's very schematic, and I sacrificed some accuracy for this map. Uh, but the 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 
sort of faint traces of the road running between uh, two rows. There were two rows of houses running along this road, and then the railroad was up above them. Um, and so I have been excavating at three of the houses, or around three of the structural foundations, which were the collapsed chimneys. Um, so some of the units are inside the houses, some are sort of right next to the houses, but it's really a kind of um, domestic archaeology project. So I plan the excavations oriented to these loci, the structural foundations. Um, we've excavated four units in and around, in and around uh, three houses, the three houses, three, uh, two by one meter units, one by one, and a one by one test pit. This is very unimportant. Um, so we're gonna uh, place a unit in sort of the middle of the fireplace over here, but the other two ones are densely overgrown by trees, by hackberry and oak trees. Um, and it seems that when the houses were abandoned, the chimneys collapsed, the trees grew on top of the fireplaces because they were fertilized by the ash. Um, so then after excavating in there, I'll place a series of one by one test um, fit units around uh, the small grid, um, especially targeting any privies. I think there's some evidence of some privies. Um, as anticipated and in line with Bergstrasser's findings, most of what we found has been pretty unglamorous. Window pane glass, unidentified metal fragments and nails, and lots of coal. Um, but we have also found a handful of diagnostic artifacts, which I now turn. Uh, these are the presences uh, tracing the outlines of the absences. Uh, given the general scarce material record, it's my single objects assume outsized narrative weight, something I lean on here. The absences open up different trajectories of investigation. So here is more of the site. That is, you know, we wish it was that time, which is the spring. Um, and so that's what Smythe looks like in April, I guess. And then this is what it looks like now. <laughs> Pretty dramatic. Um, this is one of those mounds um, where one of the house houses was, um, the, the fireplace. Um, here is a glamour shot. <laughs> that's another one of the mounds. Um, that's one of the mounds that's totally overgrown by trees, um, and then we're just excavating right around it. And here's another one of those, just piles of bricks. Um, these are the sort of only sort of visible uh, remains of the houses themselves. Uh, just a unit, a two by one. Okay. Um, so first, what is... Um, immediately and obviously missing in the assemblage recovered so far at Smythe. Uh, for one, the ceramic sample recovered is overwhelmingly plain whiteware, uh, along with some plain milkware and porcelain shirts. We have only recovered two decorated shirts at all, one being whiteware with the black bands along its rim, and then a porcelain shirt, shirt embossed with a floral motif. Taking this all but absence of decorated ceramic to signal something, the first inference drawn, and what I really hammered home already, is that Smythe residents have hardly any access to higher quality goods. Another inference I draw is that ceramic was not valued because it could not be easily transported as people move from job to job, hopping the rail seasonally and often. So, you know, uh, ceramic would break and it would be very hard to transport. Um, and then also what's missing from the assemblage of Smythe are um, pieces of any larger portable objects. Um, there, any of the metal and glass is, 90% of it is architectural. So it's mostly nails um, and window pane glass um, and then bottle glass, of course, but nothing sort of uh, that could be carried with one or, you know, it was all disposable like the bottles around I mean, there, there wasn't even that much bottle glass. It was 90% probably window pane and nails as far as metal and glass goes. Uh, and also just a reminder, this right now is like me just looking at things and thinking and just sort of, this is all very speculative right now. Um, so if ceramic glass and metal at Smythe are for the most part unilluminating, as a product of the inhabitants' conditions of poverty and frequent, frequent mobility, we might wonder which classes of artifacts are selected for by these constraints. What do people value when they cannot take much with them on the road? 
So what material lives outside on the outside of the many conspicuous gaps or absences? Uh, what material escapes erasure? Another absence at Smythe um, is animal bones. We did not find pork or chicken bones, which I thought we might. Um, we haven't reco recovered fallen remains at all, um, except uh, tiny rodent skull um, mouses. <laughs> Uh, Smythe occupants apparently maintained a meat poor diet for further highlighting their poverty. As far as diet goes, we did find a peach pit, several types of unidentified seeds, still unidentified, and then a lot of snap pea, po uh, snap pea pods, um, which is right there. Uh, a small overgrown field is faintly discernible between Smythe E and the company store. The ridge and furrow formations are visible, and portions of a few wooden fence posts remain that mark the extent of the small field. Snap pea pods were found in this area, as well as in domestic spaces of Smythe E. It seems that occupants of Smythe were cultivating small-scale provisions outside their employment as subcontract workers, uh, so off the clock. Um, Black study scholars have made much of this kind of supplementary provisioning on plantation contexts, where small plots were maintained um, where people might be allowed to work on them on the weekends. Um, critic Sylvia Winter theorizes these plots as sites of resistance in the dominant plantation logic on the outside of those relations of exploitation. Might this kind of um, plot at Smythe have offered an outside to Smythe inhabitants too, an outside to the dominant mode of extraction? Even if their access to meat ap appears to have been limited, Smythe residents did seem to partially fill that gap by hunting. Um, in two units uh, at one of the houses, we found a shell casing and a bullet casing um, and many fragments of clay pigeons, um, which are targets for skeet shooting. Uh, so the 12 gauge shell casing is of the Winchester New Rival series with a head stamp that was used from 1901 to 1919, and the bullet casing is of a 38 Smith & Wesson special revolver. The 12 gauge would have been suited to hunting deer in Turkey. Um, both the 12 gauge and the revolver are commonly used for target practice for ski shooting. Um, and the clay pigeons here um, are of two companies, White Flight and Blue Rock. Um, they were in the style of the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, beyond hunting, the presence of a Smith & Wesson revolver also speaks to potential for armed conflict at Smythe. Uh, there is documentation of this kind of violence during the strike at Ishkuda. During the 1899 strike mentioned earlier in this paper, conflict erupted between Black Ishkuda miners and Black strike breakers imported from Georgia and, and South Carolina by TCI to break the strike. Labor Advocate reports on July 22, 1899, that a party of Ishkuta miners um, ambushed a gathering of strike breakers, killed three of them, uh, before shooting became generalized around the camp for an hour. Um, whether or not violence commonly erupted at Smythe, uh, we might infer that the population was well armed and that conflict remained a potentiality, uh, given many inhabitants uh, had been strike breakers with interest directly counterposed to the subcontract laborers. The labor advocate article notes that TCI imported strike breakers from Georgia and other Southern states. And in 1910, 26 residents um, at Smythe were born in Georgia. This is where it gets very speculative. Um, given residents small scale agriculture, is it possible that they sold a surplus for cash, thereby escaping the problem of being paid in scrip? As Smythe residents were paid in scrip, a structural component of the labor model, and if you don't know what scrip is, it's company currency where it's not redeemable anywhere else. So it's just fake money, all money's fake, but it's fake money. Um, so we might, because they were paid in scrip, um, a structural component of the labor model, we might expect a total absence of fiat currency altogether. We did, however, find one 1915 penny um, immediately outside the front doorway of one of the structures. Uh, besides the convenience of the penny giving us a good reference date, one that accords with the hypothesized 1920 abandonment of the site, uh, the penny also speaks to access to currency outside of script. 
course, a penny marks very little, um, but its presence rather than absence does denote at least some access, access to sovereign currency. Another interpretation remains open for what could have been, and this is where I start to say could have been a lot. Um, uh, and another interpretation remains open for what could have been. Uh, the penny was found around the front threshold of the house. Um, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, a uh, folk tradition held that placing a penny over the front door or bur buried beneath the threshold upon a house's construction conferred luck to its occupants. Uh, to the topic of potential charms, uh, we recovered another striking artifact in close contextual proximity to the penny. Um, it's a turquoise cabochon, which is, um, you know, turquoise the gemstone, and a cabochon is just the way that it's cut, and it's often used for jewelry, um, especially now it's kind of glued onto things, And um, but this one was not on any kind of ornament, or you know, it wasn't on a ring or anything like that. Um, so finding it detached from any ornament uh, suggests it could have been carried on its own, probably was, without an accompanying vehicle uh, to entertain the what could have been. Uh, could not the cabochon been imbued with densely symbolic and likely spiritual properties, holding power for its bearer as a kind of charm? Blue is overwhelmingly the most common, commonly found bead. Um, the most commonly found bead um, color at African American sites, archaeology sites. Um, the cabochon, resembling as it does a variation on the bead form, the turquoise might have been prized for its color. Blue beads have been determined to have served as charms or amulets for Af African American communities from colonial through antebellum sites in the South. It takes little imagination to perceive the general importance of the color blue for Black Southerners, the blues, of course. In the South, the color blue has been spiritually associated with protection from illness and misfortune. Uh, this all is very speculative, um, sort of hazardly so, um, and marks a kind of reading trained um, by critical fabulation, by the what could have been. Uh, but to continue this line, uh, the turquoise of the cabochon as a pale blue could have been perceived as the color paint blue. Drawing on hoodoo influences, the Gola of the Low Country believed this shade of blue to ward off paints or ghosts from the home. Given Smyth's 26 Georgia-born inhabitants and three as well from South Carolina, uh, these emigres could have imported paint blue and its significance with them to Smyth, with the cabochon having indexed as power. Printed kind of weird. Uh, similar to the cabochon in artifact class, we also recovered an ornamental cranberry red glass pendant. Um, and we found a dark uh, green bead in the same unit, uh, possibly living on the same thread as the pendant, with a pendant as the centerpiece of the ornament. Uh, one need only look at the pendant to appreciate its potential symbolic value. Um, and no need to draw the transhistoric uh, symbolism or affective register of the color red. It surely is the sort of possession that a person at Smythe would have held especially close as a keepsake, perhaps as an heirloom, perhaps a gift, and surely precious for its wear. The small pendant, like the cabochon, is an object that would travel especially well while Smythe families were mobile. Surely the loss of the pendant through the floorboards of her home would have greatly distressed its bearer. One wonders on which occasion in a mining camp a pendant like this would be worn. To a wedding, to church, or is the cranberry red too showy and suggestive for such a context? Maybe to date, maybe on dates to the company store. Um, an item recovered uh, that pertains, an item recovered that pertains to male dress uh, is a bifaced milk color collar button found in two pieces in the same unit. Uh, the smaller backside uh, is, a slightly more is slightly more yellow than the other, and so they might come from two buttons of different makes. The collar button, as a type, uh, was related to the 19th century in invention of the stiff celluloid detachable collar. Previously, collared shirts had been reserved for the wealthy who could afford to frequently launder their clothes. With the detachable collar, 
dress shirts became widely available to the non-wealthy classes, as the celluloid required no laundering. One can only imagine the challenges of doing laundry at Smythe, um, which would have been frequent, which would have been frequently required, with miners, of course, dirtying their clothes daily. The problem of laundry was made worse by the general sanitation problem at Birmingham mining camps, with Smythe houses sharing small spigots, um, several houses uh, would share a single spigot outside. Uh, the collar button would have helped ease this problem, permitting even mining workers at Smythe to dress up. Like the pendant, one wonders what occasions would call for dress shirts at Smythe. If women had pendants for their dates to the company store, perhaps men, perhaps men had their dress shirts. But it is a curious problem. What were people dressing up for in a mining camp? Um, uh, if certain classes of artifacts, the one, the few that I just talked about, um, Sorry, uh, certain classes of artifacts were less frequently encountered at Smythe, such as ceramic, um, for the difficulty of its transport. The cabochon, pendant, and collar button represent the sort of small, durable keepsakes that were highly valued at Smythe. They signal a minimal kind of luxury found on the outside and of the outside, on the outside of, and in, in indifference to residents' exploitative working and living conditions. Uh, this is a um, cool drawing I found in the, an antique store, um, but it is a drawing of another mining camp uh, at the turn of the 20th century that was um, pretty close to Smythe. And so I've taken it as kind of, um, you know, probably sort of what Smythe looked like. Um, I don't think the houses at Smythe were on stilts. Um, and, uh, but, you know, the road running between two rows. Um, but this was actually drawn by um, A.G. Prince, which was this man who worked his entire career in the steel mill um, in, I think, in Ensley uh, in Birmingham. Um, and he got really into drawing industrial sort of sites and sort of infrastructure. Um, he didn't actually draw this on site. This is a drawing he made of a photo that I haven't traced down um, of a must photo. He was drawing mainly in the 60s and 70s, I think. Um, but yeah, I just found this original drawing and looked into it and sort of realized how cool it was. Um, but yeah, this is probably what Smythe looked like, sort of roughly. Um, so now, the final conclusion. Um, so taken together, a few inferences might be drawn from this small collection of diagnostic artifacts. The pea pods and fence posts, the penny, the ski shooting and hunting, the cranberry pendant, the bifaced collar, collar button, uh, the turquoise cabochon. Smythe residents might not have remained much in their possession. These absences as an output or consequence of the structural conditions of their labor. So Smythe workers and their families were selective about the kinds of things they chose to hold on to. The low volume of artifacts in general presents challenges for an empirical approach to the available data. But the absences retrain my attention on the few highly illuminating artifacts at the boundaries of those absences. The shortcomings in volume uh, compel me to explore the limits of in inference, interpretability, and sayability. Black subcontract workers and their families were poor, yes, but they could have carved out material life worlds in the interstices of a racialized extraction, extractive regime. I don't mean to romanticize what would have undoubtedly been um, an often debilitatingly challenging life. Uh, despite the obvious barriers to living well at Smythe, um, inhabitants did engage in practices apart from the precarity of their labor position. These practices were substantive, symbolic, spiritual, and undertaken for the sake of pleasure for its own sake. They grew food, they had access to contraband cash, at least a little. They undertook recreational activities like skeet shooting. They retained symbolic and potentially spiritually animated keepsakes, and they managed to dress up well um, for occasion. Smythe residents occupied a provisional outside to the racial and economic exploitation. They might be said to have practiced an ethic of fugitivity, an analytic used across Black studies to conceptualize a certain insurrection, insurrectionary potential latent in Black American life as a historical response to the collective experience of racial terror. The Black residents of Smythe were mostly first and second generation free people 
with a few of the oldest in the camp having born into enslavement, having been born into enslavement. A practical and historical knowledge of how to best live in spite of oppression survived at Smythe and their living in that outside to the latest iteration of racialized labor, um, expropriation, and alienation. Um, theorist Fred Moten says, quote, fugitivity then is a desire for and a spirit of escape and transgression of the proper and the, and the proposed. It's a desire for the outside, for a playing for a playing or being outside, an outlaw edge proper to the now always already improper voice or instrument. We do know that Smythe workers and families lived a life of escape, a flight, able and willing to quickly get up and go to the next mining camp or settlement. As much as the subcontract system very really did violently alienate their labor, it also offered real possibilities for movement workers being unimpeded by any contract or agreement, or put another way, unimpeded by any settlement. And Smythe as a site lived in the, as a site, Smythe as a site lived in the cracks of industrial development in Birmingham, situated as it was across Red Mountain from the mines and from Birmingham proper, with the mining camp escaping the surveillance of TCI management. How did this out of sight sightedness, how did this out of sightedness open up certain possibilities for practice that were indifferent to all the very real challenges to residents' well-being? And what of their out of sightedness in terms of the historical and archaeological record? Is this another indifferent refusal of theirs? All it can really do in the end is say what could have been. Uh, to return to Hartman, quote, the necessity of trying to represent what we cannot, rather than leading to pessimism or despair must be embraced as the impossibility that conditions our knowledge of the past and animates our desire for a liberated future. As an anarchival archeology, span the erasures, the gaps in the available data invite speculative interpretation, a certain kind of flight, but also challenge empirical claims to the strength of an inference. Absences often refuse their filling, inviting the archeologists to do little more than trace their outlines. To trace an absence's outline is to attend to the material presences that do remain on the outside of the contingently conditioned absences, few in number as those material presences might be. But by allowing just a few objects to track their to track new trajectories, the outside of racial capitalist erasures that Smythe could have been the presence of fugitive material lives lived otherwise. Thank you. Exactly, no time for questions. <laughs> have any? Yeah. So we really only have three minutes. Yeah. Did you say that's in Red Mountain Park? It is in Red Mountain Park, right? Right in the park. Yeah, there actually um, there were three mining camps in Red Mountain Park. Yeah. Yes. You said that. Um, guess what? Yeah. Milk class. Milk class. Um, for me, you did that because he's it's only gone down around three houses so far. Mm -hmm. Um, and you said that y'all found how many little McDonald's on? No. Um, this is a weird question, but did they have a lot of canned goods? That was also, um, we did find a lot of um, metal. We didn't find cans though, mm -hmm. which was a really interesting point, too. Um, so I was thinking like canned meat or anything like that. Yeah, I worked at other sites at the same period where we were finding cans every you know, every hour. And we just haven't found any cans this time. Did you find any under the A near the store? No, not even near the store. Yeah, they weren't eating canned food apparently. <clears throat> yeah. You said there's several houses we share as they did. How many houses we share as they did? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Do you know if any, um, I don't know if it's recorded, but like, uh, burial places that they might use or there was certainly one in the park but i'm aware okay yeah. so so it's kind of like the the unknown it is that is unknown and um there are ways i can obviously spend more time looking for it but it would take a lot of effort and i haven't had the time yet yeah uh, i'm just kind of like speculating for for ways to access the documents from the company right because finding a burial is like um both I mean, we know where they are, um, but B, you could possibly request a FOIA from the company mm -hmm. because now you have a burial plot that relates to. That's a great idea. Yeah. That's leverage. Yeah. Yeah. 
when we were out there helping you excavate, I was surprised by how many um, was it flakes you were yeah. finding. I wondered if you had any um, speculation. I don't, and that. I obviously left that out because it didn't really have a place in this paper that I could very easily sort of intuit, but we did find a lot of lithic flakes, and we found them very shallow, so there are real questions about why we were finding lithic flakes at a you know, turn of the 20th century site. Was the soil tilled at all? There was a very thin layer of topsoil, but not obviously. We were hitting, yeah, we were hitting, um, yeah, there was very little topsoil and we were hitting sort of material pretty quickly under that. Or a plow pan and that was, you know. I have two questions now that we talked about the base, but um, how close would the site have been to like a water source in a park? Um, there, there were a lot of creeks that are seasonal mm -hmm. um, that would cut um, sort of straight down the ridge, and there, there was a there's a seasonal creek really close. Um, yeah, but there's not a um, year round sort of uh, waterway very close mm -hmm. to the site. Yeah. And then the second question would be: um, Are there any like the park? Does do they have any maps? Are they done any previous surveys of? You know, you said that there's not really a lot of um, maps of burials and things like that. Yeah, I haven't found. I mean, they don't have anything. Um, they they know that. I mean, I I use I was in touch with the the director who's no longer there, um, but he had his master's in history and was just like very sort of generally very interested in this project and was very supportive. Um, he knew uh, that there had to be a cemetery somewhere in the park, but he didn't know. I mean, he didn't know where. Um, he also very vaguely knew where these sites were, but I had to do some looking around. There is the archaeologist, uh, Jack Bergstrasser, who works at the site in 2011. Um, I've met with him a handful of times, but he's retired now, and so I don't have close contact with him. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, his project was short, short term. He also had like a pretty small sort of uh, coverage. Um, and other, other than him, no one's worked in the park. So no one's in CRM or map anything. He's the, he's the only CRM person that's worked in the park, yeah. Do you know um, about the, the strike breakers? Do you know um, if they would have also taken up residence around in this area or if that would have? I think they were. I think they were living in spite. Okay. Yeah, because there are a lot of people from Georgia and other southern states. And uh, the article sort of reporting on the strike uh, said that the strike breakers came in from Georgia. And others on their states. So, uh, yeah, they, yeah. I mean, it's really interesting, kind of, uh, you know, that kind of different kind of labor conflict where you have unorganized subcontract workers being pitted against uh, strike breakers because um, they didn't have any bargaining power. So it was technically unorganized and unorganized strike. Right? Were the masters were they white workers? Were they so that's a good question. Some they some were white, some were black. Did yeah. they live on site? They lived on site. Yeah. And then when you have the census records, does it mention the families like or just it does? Yeah. We have, yeah. I mean it'll list them as like head of household and then each person's relation to the family, you know, wife, daughter, son. So you can sort of speculate how many people lived in each house. Exactly. You can actually I haven't done it. Yeah, but I think there's a way to actually do some kind of GIS analysis and actually like maybe like, you know, it would be pretty, um, but maybe pin individual households to individual structures. Is it like, um, these cost path analysis or something? So did you have any like referential studies of similar mining camps in other areas and did they have similar um, gaps in the records? Not like this. I've worked on other mining sort of camp projects um, in different in different states in different contexts. Um, but I sort of mentioned this a little bit. I think of like my projects more sort of historical archaeology than industrial archaeology, mainly because um, there aren't as many industrial archaeologists working on like sort of people's lives. Um, so most industrial archaeology deals with infrastructure. Um, so there are a handful of really great industrial archaeologists who are doing historical archaeology as well. And I've worked on a couple of industrial projects working in minor, um, mining quarters. Um, the sort of particular absence in Birmingham is sort of related to the fact that pretty much the whole city was owned by companies. I mean, the whole city was sort of built as a big sort of composite company town. Um, so 
it's not just my, but it's like there's a huge gap in Birmingham city records too. And I've talked to the city archivist about it. And, you know, it's like before, before New Deal basically era, um, there's just this massive hole in available documentation um, in Birmingham, mostly because a lot of it's retained by U.S. Steel. And a lot of different researchers have tried to get access to these documents. But when you've seen that in, in I mean, uh, certainly this isn't the only place where it was in the county in West Virginia. And no. And everything. They were somewhere. Right. Yeah. No, I don't know. If, I don't know if they were, if the, those erasures were a start in places like West Virginia or Pennsylvania. That's something I should follow up on. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, workers, well, I guess, did, is there any, anybody looking at like, where they came from and where they went? Or the, the I haven't, haven't traced the pathways, uh, but that's also something that would be very doable with the information that we have. I'm sure you've contacted Birmingham Public Library. Mm -hmm. I've, yeah, I've worked in there a lot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've looked through all those documents, um, the Lynn Henley. Her research library is attached to the public library, and that's where I've done most of the archival work. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. I think you've got a, a question from a person. Oh. Oh. I guess that. Or, or type it in the chat, maybe. Be like, yo. Oh, oh I see. Yeah. You're probably just talking to the microphone, they might hear you. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, okay, so I just got this question from Dominique. Um, in what ways do you see this project helping to decolonize our historical knowledge of Alabama and potentially archaeology in practice? Um, you know, I, I think that my project is engaging with decolonial thought. And, uh, not much of that work has been done in Alabama, although there is some uh, work of that sort happening in Mobile um, in the colonial archaeology out of South Alabama. And then also work done at Africa Town out of Mobile, um, the Clotilde uh, side of that community. So there is work being done in the state, uh, but not directly in Birmingham that I know of. Uh, there are lots of histories of the city, uh, but they sort of have a, a different uh, you know, a different approach uh, to the knowledge of them. So I mean I would I would help I would hope that my project can contribute uh, to that archaeological project in Alabama. Um, and yes, archaeology is in practice too. Um, I think I'm definitely thinking those words. So thanks for asking. I didn't know you were